Let's take a look at the ideas that underlie Beer's Law. Let's assume this box represents the sample solution. When we perform a photometric measurement, we have a light beam of intensity I sub naught coming into the sample, and a light beam that represents the transmitted light coming out the other side. The ratio of the transmitted intensity to the incoming intensity is known as the transmittance. The transmittance is not a linear function of the absorbing concentration. However, if we do take the logarithm of that ratio, we get something that is proportional to the concentration of the absorber. If we want this quantity to increase with concentration, we have to multiply by minus 1. And we usually write this with two proportionality constants, and we'll talk about those in a moment. This term we call the absorbance, and it happens to be a unitless quantity. Let's look at this equation a little closer because it helps us understand some of the assumptions and some of the limitations to its use. One of the assumptions that we make is that we are working with a single wavelength of light. We say it's monochromatic. That's an ideal. In practice, we use lamps that produce light over a broad range of wavelength. Then we apply a device, usually a monochromator, to select a small segment of that light. So we actually use a narrow range of wavelength. And so we refer to this as the band pass, and it has a finite band width. So our assumption that we have monochromatic light is an ideal. It will be convenient for us to think of the particle nature of light, and then we can define the intensity in terms of the number of photons per second that are passing through our sample. Let's consider a beam of light of intensity I as it strikes an ultra-thin slice of our sample solution. Let's imagine that that slice is only one molecule thick. Some of the photons in the beam are intercepted by absorbers. So the intensity of the light being transmitted is equal to the light going in minus a tiny amount. We'll represent the area illuminated with this script A. And that will have units in square centimeters. Now let's think about the absorbing molecules in this thin, thin section. We might imagine for each of those molecules, there's a zone in space surrounding that molecule within which a photon can be captured. So if we're outside that region, the photon is not absorbed. And if a photon enters that zone, it is successfully captured or absorbed. Let's use an A of this type to represent the effective cross-sectional area of the capture zone. We note that this A is a fixed property of the molecule and the wavelength that we're using. Let's consider the probability of a successful absorption. Let N equal the number of photons absorbed per second. For our thin section, that's equal to DI. That probability ought to increase as the ratio of the capture zone compared to the illuminated area increases. It also ought to be proportional to the number of absorbers in our thin section. And of course, the more photons we throw at this thin section, there ought to be more photons that are captured. We put a negative sign in here to indicate that it's a decrease. It's interesting just to regroup the terms a bit. Putting the number of absorber molecules over the illuminated area makes us think about a concentration. So we have the change in photons equal to the intensity times a concentration factor times the capture area. But we're not used to working with molecules per square centimeter. We'd prefer to use something like moles per liter. Well, how could we convert that to moles per liter? Well, if we multiply the denominator by the thickness of this thin section, that would give us uh, cubic centimeters, a volume unit. And we can convert cubic centimeters to liters by multiplying by 
10 to the minus 3. And we can convert from molecules to moles by dividing by Avogadro's number. In other words, n over a divided by dx 10 to the minus third and Avogadro's number will give us units of moles per liter, which is a concentration we're more comfortable with. So if we rearrange this to solve for n over a, we can see what we need to substitute in our original expression. So we will substitute for this ratio n over a with the term we have on the right. Now let's group the intensity terms together. And as you probably anticipated, we'll integrate this. On the right hand side, we'll integrate from 0 to the path length b. And on the left hand side, we'll integrate from the incident intensity i sub naught to the transmitted intensity i sub t. When you do that, the left hand side becomes the log of the ratio of the intensity transmitted over the intensity going into the system. The right hand side just becomes a times 6.022. 10 to the 20th times the concentration times the path length b. You notice we have this in terms of the natural log. We're more comfortable with common logs. So if we remember the relationship that the natural log of x will to 2.303 times the log of x. And we can make that substitution to get the common log of the ratio of i sub t over i sub naught is equal to a product of some constants, including the path length b times the concentration. Recall that A is a fixed property of the molecule and the wavelength, and so all of this group here is a constant. It is a fixed property that we'll call epsilon, or the molar absorptivity. So we have the log of the intensity ratio is proportional to the concentration and the proportionality constants are epsilon bc, and that is the absorbance that we noted before in Beer's law.